Hey, welcome back once again. I am and always remain Pastor Kempfert, Pastor Jacob Kempfert, here in my study at Gloria Dei Lutheran Church in beautiful Saginaw, Michigan. Welcome back. God's peace and blessings to you. And this week, the Word of God comes to us from the book of the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 2. And we're going to take a look at verses 1 through 5 there. And this, in particular, is Ezekiel's call by God to be a prophet. And so we uh, read there as follows in Jesus' name, beginning with the first verse. And he, uh, that is the Lord, he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants also are impudent and stubborn. I send you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. And whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. This is God's word. My dear fellow prophets of the living God, that is something you have in common with Ezekiel, this man who lived about 2,600 years ago all the way around the world. You both are prophets. Now, maybe you've never been called a prophet before, and maybe you don't feel like you're a prophet, but you are a prophet. In you, the anointing that happened to you in baptism and by faith in Jesus created in your heart by the Spirit, you are called to do the work of a prophet, and you are anointed as a prophet. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to be able to predict the future because that's not the main work of a prophet. Sometimes that's incidental. Prophets are able to predict the future, especially in the Old Testament. But the main work of a prophet is to speak the word of God. That is to have the word of God revealed to you and then communicate that, speak that, preach that to other people. And this is exactly what Jesus calls us to do when he tells us, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. And also in his great commission to his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations. And how do we do that? How do we make disciples? By baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And also by teaching them to observe everything I have instructed you. So all those words of Jesus that are the Holy Scriptures, we teach them, we speak them to others. And in that process, that is how the Spirit makes disciples of Christ. So Now you may feel you are unsuited to this work. You may feel like you are not worthy to wear that heavy mantle of the great prophets of old. You may feel insufficient to this call. Maybe you feel inadequate in your abilities and gifts to share the gospel. Maybe you feel embarrassed by the gospel and sharing it with others. Or maybe you feel ill-prepared to talk about your faith or unsuited to talk about your faith in Jesus. Maybe you feel awkward when you do that. But see, that those feelings of being unsuited and insufficient, that's exactly what a great prophet would think and feel. Because that's exactly what Ezekiel felt. That's exactly what Isaiah and Jeremiah and Moses, all of them felt and said. All of whom, when God calls them specifically to speak his word, express their own insufficiency, their own inadequacy for the task God has called them to do. But when God's prophets respond to his call with, I'm inadequate, I'm too sinful, I'm too weak, I'm too stupid, I'm too young, I'm too old, I don't have the right gifts, I don't know what to say or how to say it, then to every last one of these prophets, God replies something like this. He says, does the Almighty Lord make mistakes? Would I have given you this faith to share if I knew that you were unable to share it with others? Would I have called you to proclaim the gospel to the whole creation if it was not possible for you to do that in whatever corner of creation I have placed you? Does the creator so poorly misjudge his own dearly loved creation? 
Is the Almighty Lord so weak that he calls you to a task, but he's completely unable to help you and give you everything you need to fulfill that task? Look at this from Ezekiel's call by God, Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And the Lord said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. So notice what happens when God speaks to his prophets and calls them to task. The Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. Did you notice that? Even though God tells Ezekiel, stand up, Ezekiel doesn't stand up. He doesn't stand himself up. Rather, the Spirit of God stands him up. So my dear fellow prophets, it is God who takes all of the initiative. It's God who works in the first, in the middle, in the last. It's God who breathes his Holy Spirit and his life into us through his holy word. It is God who forgives all sins in the first place. It's God who heals all corruptions, who raises us up from the dead, and who saves souls in his kingdom for eternity. And so it's also God alone who empowers his prophets to do the job he's given them to do. The Holy Spirit of God is the one who brings all of the necessary gifts to those he has called. God says, I will speak to you. God doesn't put everything on Ezekiel to come up with the words to say. He doesn't put it all on you to figure out how to do this. God doesn't say, Ezekiel, go tell them your opinions. Go tell them what you think is wrong with the world. Then go figure everything out and tell them how you think it should be fixed. No, God says, I will speak to you. God promises, I will give you the words that you are to say. Jesus promises this exact same thing when he tells his disciples, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. The Holy Spirit will teach you what to say in the very hour that you need to hear that. Trust in that promise. God made this promise to you. Trust in that. Hold God to that promise. Because that is the exact same word of God's promise that has also told you, I have forgiven you everything. Because the blood of Jesus shed for you on the cross has purified you from all of your sins. I've put your sins to death and buried them in the tomb of death along with the body of my son in his own tomb. And that means also I have raised you back to life with my son's resurrection from death. So hear this word that I tell you and trust in my word because I, the everlasting to everlasting creator of all things, I, the Lord of life and conqueror of death, I am the one making this promise to you in this word. I am the one keeping my word for you. So now go and, and share this word with others. And that's actually the next step of the prophet's call. The first step is stand up on your feet, pay attention, be raised up to life. And the next step is go share this word I'm giving you. Go share this life with everyone else. We pick up at verse 3. And he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants also are impudent and stubborn. I send you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. Once again, it's not Ezekiel saying, This thus says Ezekiel. It's Ezekiel saying, Thus says the Lord God. Here's what God has revealed to us in his word. And this also tells us an important truth. When you take up the task of prophecy, that is when you take up the task of speaking God's word, as we are all called to do by faith, when you do that task, you will be opposed. You'll be opposed by a culture that is at best indifferent to the gospel and at worst openly hostile to it. But notice Ezekiel is called to the people of Israel, to the people that had the promise of God through whom the Messiah would come into the world. So we will also be opposed 
even by those in Christianity, the people of God, who so eagerly forsake the truth of God's word to conform to the cult of culture. And we also, in our own hearts of sin, will face opposition. Because in our own sinful flesh, the gospel is opposed by indifference, by persistence in rebelling against God's will, and by laziness towards God's salvation that he has so freely given to us. So when you take up the task of prophecy, you will be opposed. But what's the other option? Not taking up the task of prophecy not doing that to which you've been called, that which you've, you've been empowered to do by the very Spirit of God, not inviting others to hear this gospel of forgiveness and salvation that is surely theirs in Christ Jesus? What is this other option other than indifference to the gospel that we're called to share? And what is this indifference except opposing God's will? rebelling against the one who has called you by his word through faith and now desires you to share this word with others. If taking up the task of prophecy sounds like a hard task because God guarantees you'll face opposition, then, dear prophets, think how much harder a task it will be to stand before God and have him say to you, I told you to go and you still wouldn't go? I gave you opportunity after opportunity and still you didn't speak. I gave you my word and still you didn't trust it. Why not? If being opposed by humans sounds like a hard task, think what a hard task it will be to stand before the living God at the end of a lazy, cold, fearful, and silent life and hear him say, I never knew you. Instead, dear prophets, listen to God's word. Listen to the call that he is giving you today through that very word. And whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. God says there will be rebellion, there will be opposition, but Notice he doesn't say they may refuse to hear so you don't really have to bother speaking to them. No, he says whether they hear it or not, whether they listen or not, whether they oppose you or not, speak to them. You don't know that they won't listen. You don't know that they won't listen. I mean, look at Saul on the road to Damascus. Saul, the persecutor of Christ himself, the persecutor of the church, the last person on the face of the earth that you ever think would become a Christian. Look at Jonah being sent to the Ninevites. Nineveh, this horrible city full of darkness and sin and wretchedness, the last city on the face of the earth you ever think would repent. And yet, because of just a few words from God, the whole city does repent. You don't know that they won't listen. So even if they don't seem to listen, yet regardless, speak to them. Preach the gospel. Because that gospel is so powerful, so capable of changing hearts, that it has forgiven all of our sins, even those sins of ours that have prevented us from sharing the gospel with others. Even that sin of trying to hide the gospel, of being indifferent to the gospel, even that sin is forgiven in that very gospel. And that word is so powerful that at the end of your life, for the sake of Jesus, you will not hear, depart from me, I never knew you. Instead, you will hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. I knew you from eternity, and now you are home. That is the gospel that has saved your soul in eternity and claimed you as God's own child and proclaimed to you that because God loves you and desires your presence with him in heaven, Jesus shed his blood and died on the cross and rose again from death to ensure that that would happen for you. So now, go. 
and preach this same powerful gospel to ensure that it will also happen to even just one more soul. Go out and find just even one more lost sheep. Because even one more soul saved by faith in Jesus causes all of heaven to erupt in jubilant rejoicing. And that's how the gospel works. One by one. The Holy Spirit took great care to provide example after example in his scriptures of Jesus, of the prophets, of the apostles, all working and speaking and teaching and caring for people one by one. We think of last week's gospel reading. Jesus was surrounded by this crowd. He was mobbed by countless people, all of whom needed salvation, and yet he takes time to speak with one individual soul in that crowd. That is how Jesus works. That's how the gospel works in everyday relationships, one by one, one soul at a time. A couple weeks ago, I was in Minnesota at Synod Convention, and when I was there, uh, I heard a very eye-opening statistic. This was from a study done by the Barna Group, and it was a study of people who attended a church for the first time, why they went to that church. So of people who participated in this study, who, of people who uh, went to a church, a congregation for the first time, only 6% of people attended a church service because of some program uh, that that church put on in the community. Only 4% of people attended that church because of advertising, because of mailers or posters out in the community. But 85% of people went to a church for the first time, 85% because of a personal invitation from a member of that church, one-on-one. Now, that's not saying that 85% of the people that you invite to church will come to church, but it is saying that the overwhelming reason that people do go to a church in the first place is from a one-on-one personal invitation from someone they know or someone that they've met. And you know, that makes perfect sense because that's how Jesus worked and that's how God calls each and every one of us. The Word spoken to one heart by one heart through a Christian witness, through a prophet, through someone sharing the word with someone else. And baptism washes one soul by one soul through a Christian hand. God uses human souls to speak Christ's words to one another and to show Christ's love to one another directly, one on one, one by one. So my dear fellow prophets, not all of us can talk to everyone that we know about Jesus. That's a monumental task. But I know and I guarantee that every last one of us can talk to just one person. We all can invite just one person to church. We all can share God's word with just one person in our lives. Now I know that that can be... uh, difficult and hard thing for us to do. So, we can invite people in a variety of ways. One example is we have a a beautiful sanctuary here at Gloria Dei Church. If you've ever been here, uh, and that's one of the most frequent comments I get, is how beautiful the sanctuary is, both the outside driving past and also the inside. So we can put that beauty to use in God's kingdom. We can say, you know, we have such a beautiful sanctuary and I'd love for you to see it sometime. You should stop by and check it out. What's the worst that someone can say to that? No thank you? Okay, well then fine, then wait a week or two and ask them again. Or if you know our members here at Gloria Dei, you know that we have we are blessed by such a caring family of believers and there's such joy among the people here. And so you can say to people, I love our church, we have such a supportive and caring and joyful family here, but there's one problem with it, and that is the family is too small. So maybe you can help solve that problem. Maybe you can help us with that problem. Or you know, if you've ever uh, liked any of these sermons that I've sent out either by mail or on YouTube, If anything in the sermons has been interesting to you or beneficial, helpful to you in any way, 
you can tell someone about it. You can share that with someone. You could tell someone a specific idea or a specific point that you found interesting. And then you can ask them what they think about it. You can get engaged with them in that way. And if they're interested, if they think that's a, a cool idea, then you can invite them to hear more. You can share these sermons with them. Invite them to share in the blessings that you too have received. I know that we all have at least one family member, one friend, one acquaintance. We even run into complete strangers. And we can all ask them this question. Remember this question. You can bring it up at the next opportunity. You can ask someone, what's the biggest question that you have about the Bible? And either they haven't thought about it before, but in that case, you'll get them thinking about the Bible, or they have thought about it before and they have a question. It's likely they probably have a number of questions. And then you might be thinking, okay, but then there's pressure on me because then I got to answer those questions, right? No, there's absolutely no pressure on you to answer those questions because either they tell you a question they have about the Bible and you can answer it, or if you can't answer it, then you can tell them, you know, I know a pastor who would love to take a shot at answering that question. You can tell them, you know, you should talk to my pastor about that. He can answer that for you and he would love to meet you. Or you could ask someone, do you have a pastor? Not, not necessarily do you have a church, but do you have a pastor? Someone who can care for your soul one-on-one. -on -one. You have a doctor, right? Or you, you might have a, a dentist or a chiropractor or you have an accountant or maybe a lawyer. You should also have a pastor. Someone to comfort you with God's word. Someone to be there for you when you struggle. Someone to rejoice with you in times of joy. Please feel free. Foist people off onto me. Send people to me and put them on my shoulders. That's exactly what Gloria Dei Congregation called me here to do. And that is exactly how God works. One by one. Scripture says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? What if they don't listen to you? Who cares? Preach the gospel. And whether they hear or refuse to hear, they will know that a prophet has been among them. What if you don't know what to say? Who cares? Preach the gospel. Do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Dear prophets, that's why it's so important for us individually, one by one, to read and study God's word in our daily lives. If you're worried about not knowing what to say when the opportunity arises, well, spend time in the word. You'll have the word of God ready to go in your heart and mind when that opportunity does come up because you've spent time daily engaged in that word of God. And in that word, God the Holy Spirit tells you, he tells you, his called prophet, I hear, I've given you my word to speak. Believe me when I tell you that I will give you the words. Hold me accountable to that promise that I've made you. Because God himself says this, and scripture demonstrates this to us, and experience itself bears this out, that God works through his people, speaking his word one by one. Invite just one soul to taste and see their salvation in Jesus. Because that's exactly what God's Holy Spirit has called you to do and what he has equipped you to do. My dear fellow called and anointed prophets of God, let God's word do its saving work, one soul by one. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The peace of God, which transcends all human understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. May this peace of the gospel be with you this week and always into the future. God bless.